Hello, Ritik. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Yeah, you must be uh, busy in your arrangements. You can do this. No worries. I'm here. No issues, ma'am. Okay, Thank we'll you. start at four. Thank sure. you, ma'am. Sure. Dr. Abhishek. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining in. We'll start at four. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
evening everyone a very warm welcome to all of you on the 20th webinar of the webinar series on adolescents uh, and youth i'm aliza hassan and moderating uh, this webinar with my colleague sharon augustin i request all the panelists and audience as well there will be a poll on your screen to please take that poll till we wait for other participants to join in Ritik, can you please uh, display the poll? Thank you. And a warm welcome to everyone. I'm Sharon Augustin. And I'm Aliza Hassan. And we are your moderators for today's webinar on the topic of substance abuse among youth and children. I'd like to welcome all the panelists, teachers, students, health ambassadors who are here with us on this webinar. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce to SHARP NGO. SHARP stands for School Health Annual Report Program. Being public health NGO and pioneer in school health programs over 21 years of our organization, we have always worked in the field of public health, promoting both preventive and curative aspect of public health. Health promotion and provision of information on behavioral and health risk is the primary step to prevent any disease and striving for healthy life. At Sharp NGO, we are reaching to students, teachers, and communities, creating awareness on the harmful effects of tobacco through our programs. In spite of being aware of the harmful effects of substance abuse, children today take up this as a habit in this modern world. This requires a comprehensive prevention and control programming in schools and community to target towards the adolescents, their parents, and teachers as well. Effective measures should be taken to ensure ensuring the uh, shape of an attitude of students and children in the school as well. What the uh, consumption of alcohol, drugs, uh, and 
tobacco consumption is a global problem worldwide consumption of drugs can also lead to increase in the transmission of covid-19 covid-19 has left a big room to discuss over the topic for the same objective of discussion we here have with us our esteemed panelist dr abhishek ghosh dr gaurav nazar ms vasu yajnik setia ms anubhatia we welcome you all a few instruction before starting the webinar each panelist will speak first for 5 minutes and then we will have the question and answer round please drop your question in the q and a box with the name of the panelist and i would request all the panelists to stick to the time limit we request the audience and the health ambassador students not to flood the chat box with unnecessary messages as we tend to miss out on the important questions without further ado we invite a first panelist for the day dr abhishek ghosh he holds a degree in medicine has md in psychiatry and has done doctorate doctorate in addiction psychiatry currently he is an assistant professor at drug d addiction and treatment center at post graduate institute of medical education and research chandigarh over the years he has co-authored many articles case reports and papers and has been an awardee of young psychiatrist award 2017 by the indian psychiatrist society an early career psychiatrist fellow fellowship award by the world association of social psychiatry 2019 we welcome you sir glad to have you here thank you very much anu and uh, thank you eliza for this kind introduction it is uh, always a pleasure to be here to be associated with uh, uh, an ngo like sharp which uh, that has been working in the field of uh, school health and uh, the children and adolescent mental health for more than two decades and uh, it's a it's a pleasure privilege and honor uh, to be here as uh, as one of the panelists and it's also be a matter of pleasure to be a member of an esteemed uh, panelists uh, panel members um so uh, may i share my screen because uh, i have uh, made a few slides um so is it possible to share okay yes sir. Yeah, yeah sir you can share okay great thank you so much right can you uh, see my slides okay just a thumbs up okay thank you yes, sir. thanks okay um so i was just uh, wondering that it was uh, it is a saturday evening at 4 o'clock whether uh, it will be attended by too many people but while i was i was looking at the number of participants attending i was surprised it was like a t20 match score it kept on increasing it started i think when i joined the the they were around uh, 20 30 the uh, members were attending and at at present i'm not sure but when i last checked it was like 225 uh, it was unimaginable so thank you prima very much for attending and uh, uh, sparing some time for uh, this very important topic which i think because i work in this field for quite some time now and i feel that it's one of the most important area to be discussed uh, but uh, i am quite surprised and pleasantly surprised to see there are so many people who think like that and it is very encouraging not only uh, for people like us who have been working in the field of addiction or in the uh, field of uh, school uh, mental health or health of young children uh, but also for the nation in general uh, so thank you very much once again for attending so i have titled my talk as uh, it's go going to be maybe going to be more than 5 minutes um, so please bear with us for some time so i title my talk at is this uh, substance misuse among indian adolescent is this the elephant in the room uh, because you see that the substance misuse like many other conditions like uh, um, many other topics like uh, sexual relations uh, teenage pregnancies are not 
um, at all discussed, although they are very, very important, but not discussed because uh, people think, uh, especially sometimes parents and sometimes the teachers as well think, if you uh, talk about drug use, then you are basically introducing the topic, introducing something new to the children, and they might be tempted to use the drugs. But actually, in the course of uh, the panel discussion, perhaps we would see that uh, this is a myth rather than a fact or reality. Uh, so the big question is, this is a heading which I have uh, taken from International Business Times. And as you know, the, all the newspaper headings are notorious to be uh, you know, sensational uh, because of the media purpose, of course. So it is one of the sensational headings which caught my eyes as well. Uh, the question was, has drug abuse held the future of Indian news at ransom? Uh, I, we, we would like to uh, discuss this particular question, uh, I think, throughout the panel discussion. And I will introduce the idea uh, during my uh, initial few minutes that uh, whether it is a myth or a reality, uh, or so we observe the facts uh, from an objective viewpoint. Now, why are we so concerned about this question? Why, why are we concerned about youth? Uh, India has currently in 2018 boarded a very important bus, a bus of demographic dividend. That means the majority of the Indian population from the year 2018 to 2055, it's going to be comprised of a population who, are, who will be working, who will be at the working age. Now this demographic dividend will be, would not be transformed into a demographic disaster until and unless we take care of this particular population. Now, people who are young and adolescent at this point in time, a few years down the lane, they are going to be a very productive population or they, they are going to be the uh, major chunk of this demographic, demographic dividend. And if we don't care, take care of that, perhaps we won't be able to uh, take advantage, uh, huge adva advantage of this workforce. So that is from a purely economist point of view and from the point of view of national interest. Now, why do we concern about drug use and why are we associated an economic concept like demographic dividend with uh, drug use? All the drugs uh, are, which are um, taken for uh, abuse purpose, they are psychoactive drugs by me. Uh, what do you mean by that? They reach your brain and they affect the brain functions. And they does not affect the brain function. They do, do not affect the brain function only temporarily. Sometimes they do it for a long term, uh, for a long term basis. Yeah. And there is a problem in that because a young brain, young and adolescent brain is different from an adult brain. An adult brain is fully, as they say, mature. That means they are myelinated, their fr frontal part of the brain, their back of the brain, which is known as the midbrain and uh, the striatum, they are fully myelinated. That means the frontal part of the brain controls the decision-making process. And uh, they help, the, help a person to think about the consequences of a particular action. And this part of the brain is not mature in, in, a, new, uh, in, in a young person they are not myelinated. So at this point in time, if, he, if there is an insult with external insult in front of drugs and alcohol, the maturation process will lack further. This is known as maturation lack. So for example, if an adolescent is, adolescent brain is likely to mature at the age of 20 to 22 years, if the adolescent has been using drugs, so perhaps the maturation will take a longer period of time and might take another five to six years. So that means, the decision-making process of that adolescent is going to be impaired. Not only that, the drug, drug itself would cause a risk-taking behavior because all types of drugs will ultimately disinhibit a person. By dis disinhibition, once again means the person is not going to uh, take into account the consequences of their actions. So they are uh, going to take a uh, risky, risky decision rash decisions, which finally might um, have longer term impact. It has also been seen, especially uh, people who use cannabis 
or marijuana at an early age in the longitudinal studies it has been seen their iq points are at least 10 points less than their normal counterparts so if we are dealing with a group of children who are children and adolescent who are because of their drug use su suffering from a maturation lag and uh, a a small i uh, means a lower iq than the counterpart so perhaps they won't be able to uh, we won't be able to optimally use the resources we have been talking about there could be problems with uh, academics and uh, academic grades and that might subsequently affect the productivity of that person and the society and the nation in general depression psychosis those kind of mental illness are two to three times more common in people who are using drugs and alcohol once again depression per se can affect a person's academic life social life family life peer relationships so everything and there is a problem of addiction of course although uh, not all the children who are using drugs would uh, would ultimately uh, develop a substance use disorder or an addiction or, but the number would be si sizable for example for opioids like heroin etc the number is as high as 30% 25 to 30% so almost one in three children or adolescent who have been using or trying opioids would finally develop opioid use disorders and by addiction we we understand that addiction means the person is kind of enslaved by the drug use we can uh, discuss this later and of course there is a possibility of roadside accidents or others there is also a significant social risk when a person is using drugs the social risk of social exclusion now for a young person for a young person the most important thing is being accepted by the peer groups sometime and paradoxically so what people do they um, for the social exclusion or to be accepted sometime by the peer group they use drugs and alcohol they don't realize at that point in time they are actually uh, getting away from the mainstream peer group who are going to be the peer group in the future what drug do pe uh, people use now this is a, a report which was published in 2013 uh, by the national commission of protection of child rights and what they have seen that most commonly used uh, drugs among children uh, is tobacco which is followed by glue or inhalants which people usually uh, usually inhale or sniff and it, it, this is more common am among street children but can also be seen or a sizable number of uh, uh, children who are staying in home at school also using glue uh, followed this is followed by cannabis then alcohol then opioids uh, especially initially the pharmaceutical opioids followed by the injection opioids now i have marked this uh, sequentially with some arrows those are important because uh, it has been seen in that particular study which is a nationwide study it included 27 uh, states and uh, two union territories um so what they have seen that generally children children start with tobacco followed by inhalant then followed by cannabis alcohol and then harder drugs the sequence is important because say for example if you if you can catch hold of children at an earlier age group and uh, can uh, intervene at the point when that that child is taking tobacco perhaps you would be able to uh, prevent further progress of drug use in that particular child this is also known as the gateway hypothesis that is there is a gateway of drug use and people usually use illicit drugs to start with and followed by the illicit drugs now about alcohol how how common is alcohol this is a study which we did about 2 years back among the among uh, colleges of chandigarh this was a randomized control trial to see the eff efficacy of brief intervention which i will i may uh, take up during the panel discussion what is it what we have seen that almost 16% of the college going students uh, average age was 18 to 19 years 
uh, were using alcohol in a harmful and hazardous pattern, which is a very serious thing. 16% not only using alcohol, but using alcohol in a harmful or hazardous pattern. We, are, uh, we were actually surprised to see the figure. Now, I must say that this is uh, the figure from Chandigarh. So it might be uh, different from uh, different for other cities, might be different uh, for villages, but this, this figure is uh, definitely concerning. Almost one in six suffering from harmful and hazardous alcohol drinking. What about tobacco use? This is a uh, meta-analysis. Meta-analysis mean, means when you uh, combine several studies and try to uh, find out a figure. Um, so what they have seen once again, the ever use of tobacco among high school, uh, high school uh, children, it's like 18%. Once again, like one in six. Uh, children use tobacco. If you think in terms of number, magnitude, you can imagine that if uh, there are, uh, if 20% of the Indian population are young, then uh, the number would be really, really staggering. You know, it, it is more than say, uh, uh, million, uh, means 20, 20, 30, 40 millions. Now, this is uh, the magnitude of uh, substance use survey, which was conducted by Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, assisted by uh, AIMS. And uh, I have only highlighted figures of two particular substances, solvent, inhalants, or glue, which I have uh, told already that Indian children use it very frequently, and uh, opioid scribble drugs. There is a particular reason for that. I mean, uh, Inhalants is only substance in the Indian context, which is uh, which has higher prevalence of use among children between you know, 10 and 17 years than adults. So children are more, more commonly, in fact, two times more commonly using uh, uh, inhalants than adults. And this opioid figure is important. You can see this 1.8% uh, of uh, children and adolescent between uh, 10 and 17 years are using opioids. This figure is more than 1.2% of the global figure of overall population using opioids. So we can imagine that, that Indian you know, children and adolescent the use every, uh, this is current use percentage, that means the used in the last three months or so, is more than, were the global use, the number is really uh, concerning and we, this is the time to, we should take note of that. Now, this uh, discussion won't be complete if we particularly talk about this particular thing, it's gaming addiction, also known as internet gaming disorder by diagnostic and statistical manual and gaming disorder by uh, international classification of diseases. Uh, so it can be either offline game and online game. Initially, people thought that it is a variety of internet addiction. So they they thought that uh, people can only get addicted to online games. But now it has been seen that offline games are as dangerous as online games. And when we call something as gaming addiction, when it it is at the cost of uh, the academic performance, the social relationship, family relationships, and peer relations. When he's affecting everything, and despite that, despite all understanding all the you know uh, disadvantages of continuing gaming, the kid is actually playing it. Uh, I think many of you have noticed this particular uh, news item from Punjab that uh, the a teen uh, sp uh, spends around hooping sixteen lakh rupees. Um, which is unimaginable, you know, that uh, somebody has uh, used, misused uh, the bank account of the father or something and uh, doing it. Uh, so they are, this is an example of addiction when, when people are kind of forced to do it, despite being aware of the consequences of the same. Now we have uh, recently done uh, a study on, once again, the college and the university students in and around Chandigarh. But we have seen that uh, those who are who are gaming, almost 10 to 15 percent of them, are suffering from gaming addiction. So, which is once again a very uh, significant number. 
Now, people ask, ask questions, who are at risk? Now, uh, I uh, am a part of a consortium, larger consortium, which is known as Siveda Consortium, which um, uh, that has actually uh, six sites all across uh, the India. And uh, Chandigarh is one of the sites, one of those six sites. Uh, there we have studied many risk factors starting from genetics, genetics and uh, brain imaging, et cetera. But we have recently analyzed the social, environmental and family risk factors. And what we have seen that there are two definite risk clusters, the high risk cluster and low risk cluster. In the high risk cluster, um, the risk starts straight from the pregnancy. You know, there are some an, an, antenatal risk factors. There are some natal risk factors like uh, difficult pregnancy, uh, not taking care of health during the time of the pregnancy, irregular antenatal visits. There are some uh, risk factors which are immediate postnatal, like uh, uh, postpartum hemorrhage or those kind of uh, postpartum complications. Uh, there are early developmental or infancy development related risk factors like delayed cry of the child, et cetera. Those are important. Delayed developmental milestone is an, is an important risk factor. There are several school related risk factors like school uh, bullying was one of them. Uh, we used uh, a particular instrument known as adverse uh, ACIQ, ACIQ, Adverse Childhood Environment uh, Questionnaire, which had several domain, including the school-related, family-related, adverse uh, environment experience domains like abuse, et cetera. And we have seen that this is a, these are all an important risk factors. There are family-related risk factors, like family history of substance use, family history of psychiatric illness. Those are also important risk factors and all these risk factors together, that high risk cluster, the substance use disorder in uh, young children and young adults and adolescents are four times more common than the low risk cluster. So- Excuse me, uh, sir, we are really falling short on time. If you can please, um, yeah. we can wrap this uh, in a, on a crispy note. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry. So uh, this is the this is something that there are several windows of opportunity. You know, we, uh, it is not uh, not just just a story of very story of despair. So we can intervene at multiple level before the initiation of the drug use, even after the when a child had initiated drug use, even of, of, uh, when a child is continuing to use drugs. So there are many options. We can talk about the options during the panel discussions. And there are several target population. We can target the entire population, which is difficult to target, but can be done uh, with adequate amount of uh, resources and commitment. Uh, we can target at-risk population or the users. There are various intervention, uh, definite interventions for these particular target groups. These intervention does not help. General media campaign, didactic lecture, and entertainment venues like creating some shops, shopping malls, etc., and thinking that kids will go there, not use drugs. It does not work. Then what works? These are uh, something which has definite, very good or excellent evidence. It's starting from parenting skill program, program to life skill education program, brief intervention, uh, and uh, changing the alcohol and tobacco policy at the national level. So we can discuss about this during the panel discussion. This is uh, one particular study in which we have seen a, in, in a randomized controlled trial that actually uh, brief intervention helps significantly. If we can follow the graph, this is the uh, adolescent who, are not, who did not receive brief intervention, their score did not change much. Whereas the group who received brief intervention, their score reduced significantly, uh, alcohol related risk score, okay. Thank you very much and uh, see you during the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It uh, was very nice hearing you and I wish we couldn't, we do not have, if we do not have any restriction, we could have heard you more in detail and talk about it. The 
figures were so alarming and the target group they are so vulnerable to look on to and we really need to work together to take children out from the situation they are into and where our generation is heading to thank you so much for the bright insight i would like to welcome our next panelist dr abhishek ghosh he is currently affiliated with health promotion division foundation of india as an adjunct research scientist he has earned a doctoral degree in epidemiology from london school of hygiene and tropical medicine with specialization in tobacco control policies dr nazal has contributed to research projects focusing on prevention of tobacco use among children adolescents advertising and promotion over to you sir thank you thank you so much uh, uh, can i uh, share my screen uh, yes sure sir is it visible uh yes so thank you thank you so much to the shop and jew for inviting me to this uh, webinar and uh, uh, requesting me to talk on this important uh, uh, aspect uh, a very important issue uh, and we have been working on this routinely and uh, i'll be talking about tobacco use particularly because uh, i think that is the um, uh, a key substance that has been uh, misused by children and adolescents so uh, i'll dive straight into the discussion uh, some facts and figures as uh, dr ghosh already mentioned tobacco alcohol are uh, uh, common gateway products to uh, of drug uh, drug abuse among indian adolescents um Uh, according to the latest global youth tobacco survey that is available the prevalence of tobacco use among school going adolescents aged 13 to 15 years was uh, reported to be uh, 14.6% uh that was way back in 2009 and we are now awaiting new results of gyts uh, they have not come out yet uh, they will soon come out but uh, the fact to be concerned about is that this prevalence has not changed much over the years like in 2000 2003 it was 16% uh, even in 2009 it has 14% uh, uh, so it, there's not much change whereas in adults we see between uh, 2009 10 and 16 17 the two surveys that were conducted with adults we saw a decline in tobacco use among adults but such decline has not been observed among youth so that is a matter of concern now there are several risk factors uh, uh responsible for this tobacco use and uh, peer pressure and uh, family influence are just one of them uh, they are of course very important but there are several others that we'll talk about advertising and promotion lack of knowledge um uh, lack of knowledge about policies lack of knowledge about health effects and misconceptions and so on we'll talk about them uh so uh, another issue is that um as observed among adults uh, uh, even in this group uh, in children and adolescents the tobacco use is higher among boys uh, compared to girls uh, but uh, the difference between the prevalence in boys and girls uh, is much narrower among uh, youngsters among children and adolescents as compared to adult males and females so that is another matter of concern uh smokeless tobacco use is also high as observed among adults among adolescents uh particularly this smokeless tobacco use is higher among females so that is another matter of concern that 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 slt use smokeless tobacco use is higher among females uh young girls so uh among the uh, risk factors uh, for tobacco use uh, another uh, one factor is that we have multiple varieties of tobacco products available in india smoking smokeless tobacco products smokeless tobacco products are much easier to hide carry with them it doesn't cause smoke although they are equally harmful but uh, they they do not cause smoke so they are easy easy to carry uh, so they uh, give opportunities for adolescents to experiment and continue the use uh along with that uh, the tobacco industry keeps introducing new products in the market 
some of them are not even classified as tobacco products for example electronic cigarettes or electronic nicotine delivery systems as we scientifically call them so these are not even classified as tobacco products uh, but they do contain nicotine and other harmful products so they have been shown to cause harm in in research conducted in the other developed countries so uh, yeah so those those these kinds of new products provide opportunities to children to explore these kinds of products and go on to uh, you know conventional tobacco products these are some studies and these more or less uh, these are some studies from india and more or less show similar kind of prevalence as uh, uh, more or less uh, to what is the national prevalence but if you see here the first study kapoor et al you can see that even 5 to 10 years old uh, have started using tobacco products 36% in this study 5 to 10 years old reported age of onset 5 to 10 years so that is a matter of concern and that was also observed in some of the field studies that we conducted as part of our studies uh, we have seen that children as young as 6 years 7 year olds are starting with those supari and and then moving on to more conventional tobacco products particularly smokeless first and then moving on to smoking so those are the kinds of issues uh, this is a school based um, uh, this slide shows uh, that school based uh, settings based particular this was in school uh, school based uh, tobacco uh, control programs uh, are effective in india uh, this is a slide from our project called maitri that is mobilizing youth for tobacco related initiatives which was a multi component tobacco prevention and control intervention it was conducted in 32 schools of delhi and chennai with about 14000 adolescents it was way back in 2004 6 uh, 2004 to 2006 when this uh, social media and those those were not so advanced uh, mobile phones were just starting and so on so during that period even during that period without the use of all those kinds of technology that is available now uh, we used the Uh, materials I'll, i'll show what kind of materials was used but they were shown to be effective this was a theoretical uh, theory health promotion theory based intervention it was based on social cognitive theory of behavior change and uh, this was shown to be effective overall we found that current tobacco use increased by 68% in the control group and decreased by 17% in the intervention group intentions to smoke also showed intentions to smoke and intentions to chew tobacco they also showed positive findings uh, the, the the decline was more in the intervention group compared to the control group uh, this was a two year intervention i'll just show uh, this slide shows uh, intervention design and the kind of materials that were used at that time it was school curriculum where hard copies of curriculum was designed and uh, it was provided to teachers and uh, there was a peer leader manual there was a teacher training manual Uh, school posters were used postcards for involvement of parents were used and some peer leaders were trained to carry out these uh, health promotion activities in the schools and the neighboring community uh, and as i said this was based on social cognitive theory of behavior change it aimed at targeting some of the known risk factors for tobacco use that is intrapersonal factors and the socio environmental factors for example lack of knowledge about harms uh, lack of knowledge about tobacco control policies uh, influencing the values meanings beliefs attitudes about tobacco uh, creating positive role models um, creating tobacco free norms in the schools or in the communities and most importantly building their skills uh, that is to lead the tobacco control movement and also uh, to resist uh, peer influence uh, or other influences that uh, make them take up tobacco use so uh, this was the kind of model that was used and we saw some positive results and uh, there was a lot of dissemination followed by uh, which followed after the study was published several papers were published and um, subsequently uh, tobacco control was also included in as a part of the school health program and the national tobacco control program so now Uh, the national tobacco control program has also come up with guidelines for tobacco free educational institution some of the questions that were asked at the beginning i saw they were they were from those kind of guidelines that were that are provided by the national tobacco control program so uh, this slide here shows uh, another project activity it was a community based uh, uh, randomized trial con conducted in 14 low socio economic communities of delhi uh, 
And again, uh, adolescents were surveyed at two different time points, uh, being a two-year intervention. So several different strategies were used, like training workshops, community-based interactive activities and outreach programs, and community-based suggestion camps, and ensuring that the tobacco control laws are properly implemented in those intervention communities. So those were the kinds of strategies that were used. This is another. This is the uh, model, conceptual model that was followed. It is similar, uh, targeting the interpersonal factors and social environmental factors. Uh, and it was observed that uh, the project successfully, the intervention successfully increased youth's knowledge about the harmful effects of tobacco. And there was a decline observed in both the intervention as well as control group in terms of tobacco use, but the decline was higher, much higher in the intervention group as compared to the control group. Coming down to electronic nicotine delivery systems or e-cigarettes as we commonly know uh, them, uh, this is a, a slide from a very recent project that, uh, that has been conducted by our organization. We assess the prevalence of electro ends use and it correlates among school-going adolescents in three urban metropolitan cities of India. That is Delhi, Hyderabad, and Ahmedabad. And um, two, there were two components to this. First was a survey, and second one was focus group discussions that were conducted. So in the survey, what we found was that about 4% 4, 4 students were ever end users. So they had used a, uh, electronic cigarettes at least once in their lifetime. Uh, at least 2% were current ENDS users, so they were currently using ENDS products, and 6%, more than 6%, intended to use ENDS in the future. And uh, there were certain correlates that were strongly associated with them, like access. Access to these products was strongly associated with uh, ENDS use. Uh, friends' use of uh, these products, family use of these products, uh, not supporting the ENDS ban. Actually, ENDS products were banned in India in September 2019 uh, when this study was being conducted. The study had already started. and uh, But but still, the P, uh, students who didn't support the ENDS ban were more likely to use ENDS. And the most important fact, uh, students who had ever used uh, tobacco products, either smoking or smokeless in their lifetime, were more likely to be ENDS users. So uh, these these are these these are strong risk factors. Access particularly was a really strong risk factor, and we found that even after the ban, these products were still available in the market. And our estimates of ever end use and current end use are higher than what is shown in the Global Adult Tobacco Survey uh, in the young age group, 15 to 24 years, uh, which GATS had surveyed. Uh, uh, the prevalence as compared to our study was lower but our study found higher prevalence of ENDS use uh, in this age group. And there are several other factors associated with that. Like there are several misconceptions like ENDS are a one-time investment or e-cigarettes are like, they do not cause harm, but there are there is a lot of research being conducted and has shown that electronic cigarettes are also harmful. Uh, although they do not contain the smoke, but they contain several other substances which are harmful. Finally, coming to compliance with uh, uh, tobacco control laws, that is the uh, COTPA. In, in India, the tobacco control law is known as COTPA, Secrets and Other Tobacco Products Act. As I said, there are guidelines given uh, for educational institutions to be declared as tobacco-free educational institutions. So we conducted this study in collaboration with uh, Manipal Academy of Higher Education in 915 schools of Udupi district. Now, why Udupi district? Because Udupi is also considered to be one of the highly COTPA compliant districts. So we expected very good results, very good compliance in this district. Uh, but what we found was uh, compliance was good only on certain indicators, like there were boards restricting sale of tobacco products within the radius of 100 yards of educational institutions. But there, there, there were tobacco control activities integrated into the school health program. Uh, so 91% uh, compliance with this. But on some indicators, you can see uh, there were the compliance was really poor. Like no smoking area, smoking area is an offense board. It was only observed in 0.2% of the schools. Uh, sale of tobacco products within 100 yards of educational institution was still observed. Uh, the tobacco control committee in schools was just observed in 5% of the schools. It is now renamed in this new revised guidelines that have come up 
they call it uh, tobacco monitors so uh, those were not present in the majority of schools and a copy of katpa was not present in the majority of the schools so even in the most uh, highly katpa compliant districts the compliance was poor and uh, we were expecting better results but unfortunately we that was not the scenario it it is possible that in other states uh, the, the scenario might be different uh, it's 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 definitely possible and then these are some other studies that are uh, that show compliance with tobacco free educational institution guidelines and again you can see that the figures are not very encouraging these are in percentages so display of no tobacco sign and uh, in educational institution 7% 3% so these are not very encouraging figures so more needs to be done in terms of implementation of uh, this tobacco free educational institution guidelines to conclude uh, i'd like to say that tobacco use among adolescents has not changed much over the years in india and that is a matter of concern and a lot more needs to be done uh, as i said uh, about electronic cigarettes the industry keeps on introducing newer products of du dubious efficacy they say that it is useful for quitting whereas we know that it is harmful and it is not effective in quitting there are several conventional quitting products available so uh, they use covert tactics to promote uh, these products to use for example social media or online sales and these these are very common and nowadays very popular among youths and these are promoted on such platforms um settings based tobacco prevention programs like i showed you examples uh, two examples the school based program and the community based programs they were found to be effective among adolescents uh, theoretical theory based interventions which also build skills of adolescents so those kinds of programs uh, targeting those risk factors for tobacco use uh, are effective and that's the way to go about um compliance with tobacco free educational institution guidelines needs to be strengthened uh, and uh, as we saw from the results that really needs to be uh, done uh, done rigorously so thank you and uh, uh, there is a national tobacco quit line and amcization uh, numbers uh, from the national tobacco control program so um, even if anyone wants to report uh, non compliance or violations of uh, those tobacco free educational institution guidelines uh, i think they can call up these numbers and uh, they can uh, report the violations thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much for sharing the facts and figures and especially the prevalence of tobacco and the onset of tobacco uh, how alarming it is and also the risk factors and uh, you've also talked about especially the two intervention school based in intervention thank you so much for sharing with us so our next panelist for the day is miss vasu yajnik setia uh, she is executive director of foundation for a drug free world india which is a 100% volunteer based and volunteer run pan india trust with the purpose to er eradicate drug abuse through education and awareness she started this initiative because she adores children and has love for humanity she is a mother a housewife a student and a scientologist and she has also worked with uh, it industry and other well known organization like apple nascom and unicef we are glad to have you ma'am over to you ma'am thank you so much thank you um i want to thank sharp ngo for allowing me the space to talk and reach out to more and more people i will quickly share my screen and try to keep within the time limit as best as i can so is that okay yes ma'am yeah i'm just going to share my screen uh one of the things i want to say that we believe we are not in the area of rehabilitation or in the area of uh, you know investigation or things like that we work with people each and every citizen uh in the area of prevention through education we believe in awareness and education and that is our primary goal we are one of the largest Uh, non-governmental um, anti-drug awareness program in the world, and uh, in India we have over seven hundred volunteers. We work through volunteers, and we reach out to people. We have reached about twenty-one um, 
states for the up to now we've touched 21 states in india and um, i'm going to skip through the movie because it's really uh, going to take time i have introduced ours and uh, when you look at the you know st- uh, media you read all of this happening you look around you um in social uh, things it's le- really alarming in a way it is alarming but i also feel that there are enough i must advocate that there are enough children and enough people who have managed to stay out of it and i must commend those people and acknowledge those people who have learned to live a life you know with what they have their own body brain and uh, things without all of that but in spite of it we do have these alarming figures of at least 70 million drug addicts in the country um by ninth grade there was a study which did that by ninth grade more than half of india students had tried some type of drug most of the youth that got caught with uh, you know drug usage did not continue up to college education gets affected youngsters who are addicted to tobacco drugs alcohol are more likely to commit violent crimes and there are suicides and we see that a lot of ju- juvenile delinquents have a history of drug abuse unfortunately in our country and many other countries we do not tie up drug use with crime directly we don't really see that if if there was a, a an accident we do look at drunken driving as a separate thing but somehow it's not tied up so we don't completely have the statistics um up to date statistics of how bad it is um it is pretty bad india is um you know has been is on the world map as one of the largest suppliers of synthetic drugs so it is actually quite shameful and uh, not a good thing and like uh, some of the other panelists mentioned what is what is happening we are not just losing losing a large part of our earning force we are not just losing a large part of our earning force because somewhere or the other uh you know we've got a convoluted idea of what constitutes gdp opening up alcohol because you don't have fu- funds or you know selling uh, uh you know drugs because you want to survive is economics is not always but what we are losing is future leaders leaders who can think who can think differently who can create a scenario for others to follow and what we find is that as mentors as teachers and educators and people who are who adequately should be supporting the youth and the adolescents do not know much about drugs in fact they are so afraid of the very word that they don't want to discuss it and if it's not discussed they will reach out to other areas which are of course um, you know there are interested parties vested interests who are controlling the media who are controlling what is put up on social media right and they have they have they they go out there and they bombard um you know the children with data which is all confusing very confusing for them right so we our aim is to reach out to educators mentors counselors of every form parents adults so that they can learn about drugs and they can start being the sources of correct information about drugs we find that people don't whether it is a child or an adult but mainly a child when you're seeking answers you will seek answers which co- somehow or the other seem to have a common agreement unfortunately in our society we do have a common agreement that some things work some things don't work right so it's easier we become like a pill taking a uh, society you have a headache pop a pill you have something get on with a pill and walk off carry on so we become there's a common agreement that the answer to everything is a quick pill you know and um, unfortunately that is that is what drives everybody and um, our aim as drug free world um, india is to create a drug free india create the mindset that leads to a drug free india and that comes from education from educating people right um we have a very very effective curriculum which we deliver into the hands of each and every educator every citizen who's willing to use that education and pass it on to people we provide it for free we provide free trainings we pro- uh, we provide free lectures we train trainers counselors and doctors and everybody whoever wants to know and that's how we believe that the culture can be changed with knowledge you bring i'll just go back with knowledge you bring 
a certain control. If I want to use a mobile phone, if I know how to use that mobile phone, I can control that phone. With that comes a certain sense of responsibility. If I want to drive a car, I have to be responsible for the car. And that's how I will, you know, be able to control the car and I should have the knowledge. So it's like, you know, we, we bring it all in. You have to have the knowledge at the bottom of it. And what is happening is that if you go to say Google or you go and find out basically who's telling these people about drugs, it's people who are, have a vested interest in it. People who could be called dealers, people who have already tried it or experimented with it. So we, um, you know, we, we try to get, make it accessible as much as we can. We have a full educator's guide, which we give for free. It has lesson plans, essays, homework assignments, certificates, everything for the teachers and educators to use to deliver uh, drug education effectively to children. And it is not a very didactic method. It is not a method of talking down to children with data. It is a very exploratory method. So getting the children to look around, I'm, I'm using the word children for adolescents also, but young people to look around them and see, is it really making that person creative? Is this, did I see that person look cool when he was drunk? Did he really look cool? So this is, it's a it's an inquiry into what they really observe. So that clears up the confusion, gives them very, very, very solid information of how drugs can harm. And they make the decisions. Nobody's telling them, don't do drugs, don't do drugs. Why not do drugs? Who's telling them? Nobody's telling them why not do drugs. They're only being told, don't do drugs. And it's being made so glamorous and they don't realize how effective people don't realize all of us we don't realize how much we are affected by the by the um, you know the culture around us there is a drug culture and that drug culture is constantly influencing us so we we don't realize that and the, once an adolescent realizes nobody wants to be controlled whether it is the media or a culture you don't want to be controlled so when the students can start questioning that drug culture, they have a chance of getting away from it and looking at something different, right? So this is our uh, curriculum. This is the educator guide and um, all the activities are there. And we cover all commonly abused drugs, which is marijuana, alcohol, synthetic drugs, ecstasy, cocaine, crack, et inhalants, painkillers and study drugs, prescription drugs. People have a, more and more people are abusing prescription drugs more than any other drug besides, of course, alcohol. Alcohol is considered a drug because it also has mind altering um, uh, capacity. Uh, we have public service announcements, which we um, play at various uh, places, which are very easy for people to relate to. We distribute booklets wherever we go. We've got these booklets. They are available online. They're available um, for, um, for us. If I can send it out. Anybody who wants can write to me and I send them out. I send out by post to many, many people as much as they want um, to distribute. And um, that's where we, uh, you know, that's where we finish. But basically, uh, what we want is that more and more counselors, addiction counselors, drug addiction counselors, health departments, social workers, teachers, educators, artists, all of them go through the training program. Our training programs are also available online for free. So you can log in, train yourself, watch a video, give the answer, get a certificate. You can also, as an educator, set up your own classroom online. And then have your students come in and conduct your uh, programs. So we've made it very, very effective on certain uh, iPads and uh, phones. You can also download the Drug Free World app. So you have handy data at all times. So if a, any child is asking you, ma'am, this is what is being told to me, uh, you, you have information to give to that child immediately. Um, so this is... This is how we do. We aim to reach the children before dealers do. That is our thing. I basically want to just uh, quickly say that whether you, whether drugs are legal or illegal, whether you decriminalize or criminalize them, whether they're obtained through a prescription or on the street, 
whether you anyone is using a drug or thinking about getting into it or if you are planning to educate the others there are a few things that you basically need to know what drugs are what they are made of what are the short term and the long term effects their potential of abuse they can be abused their potential for abuse and the damage that drugs can cause to the natural processes of your body these are the key data key things that you need to know when you speak to anybody and you give it to them without any emotional drama and the person will get the truth and that's what we believe and that we think is the key to getting rid of this pandemic the drug pandemic i am um you can take a screenshot or i can send the details of our online courses available at drugfreeworld.org volunteers can sign up and work with us um we can't reach the whole country we can't do it alone we need each and every citizen to participate in this so this is our website where you can participate as a volunteer you can write to us at dfwindia.delhi@gmail.com or call me on my number if you need any guidance assistance or any materials so we will send that material to you for free and uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak if you have any questions i'm always available thank you thank you so much ma'am it is so important to pass out authentic and uh, correct information to people and we are so happy i'm sure all of us would be so happy that you are working such a for such a good cause and you have made everything so accessible to the people who really need it thank you so much for such a bright insight i would like to welcome our uh, next panelist mrs anu uh, miss anubhatia she is a principal of st endumen school jawahar nagar jaipur had a rich experience of 22 years in the field of teaching business studies worked as cbsc trainer content develop a uh, developer manual creator on adolescence and gender she is also a, a recipient of a green school award from british council over to you ma'am Ma'am, you are on mute. I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you, Team Shah, for giving me an opportunity to share uh, my views and uh, meeting uh, such a wonderful uh, group of panelists. Where uh, because we, I won't be talking about the technical terms and uh, the facts and the figures they have shared, uh, but because we are really dealing with the future uh, creator. Uh, with a uh, future creator to create the generators generations so i would like to share my views why this intoxication is uh, like going high in the society like very important factor is now fighting for survival is not is not a tough job everyone is under the survival process and if you have heard about uh, the need hierarchy so people are almost uh, fulfilled with their basic need that is food clothing and shelter and when the survival is very easy so they think beyond it about the pleasure about the interest involvement in other areas so this type of intoxication generally these children they find it very easy way for getting into the pleasure and the next very important point is lack of lack of involvement lack of discipline because uh, here what we are seeing children are having a healthy not a healthy they are having a wealthy lifestyle wealthy lifestyle because of this ability to survive and when they are able to survive they are getting everything in hand they are most pampered they are uh, very much uh, like uh, you know deprived of getting the values or getting time from their parents and this is what happening with this generation and that is again the major cause they are getting into these uh, you know lucrative things like taking uh, drugs or alcohol or any other sort of chemical which gives them relaxation now coming to the parents point most of the parents are working and with very tight time schedule very busy life schedule so they don't have time to spend with children and what is happening because of that missing part children and parents are not connected and that lack of connectivity is affecting their health their diet their 
taking any kind of thing and that is why they are not fit and when a person is not fit and very easy way to uh, get it or to recover it is drug so it is a very easy and a very uh, you can say um, a very common way because of peer pressure so they use it and th this is the major reason that deviation is the major reason and no physical activity no fitness and just getting all the pleasure through these intoxication process then what about the status symbol peer pressure and their own uh, pressure of creating their identity now you can imagine the level of competition going on everyone is fighting for creating the image very at a very low age people are getting high uh, packages so if your peer or your friends are getting this this kind of these kind of uh, achievements and due to any kind of uh, uh, like you can say missing from any part of you can say lack of uh, proper uh, educational facilities or not going or getting these kind of things so if anything is missing they try to recover it or fulfill it with the with these kind of intoxication and values life in life skill programs we try to inculcate values and that is why as principal we are working in a hierarchical manner where we have the coordinators of different sections then they have the class teachers now with the help of counselor each and every child should share so we need to create that aura where each and every child should feel a safe and conducive environment to share these kind of things because if they are not sharing if they are not sharing they have uh, a very easy way to get into this that is intoxication so this is uh, my view because these are the reasons now what uh, can be the solution solution is we need to intoxicate from our inner there are so many inner things that can be a source of great pleasure so we need to realize it we need to make the children familiar about these things that we have lot of uh, things inside us just to realize it so more focus should be on their skill their competencies and that should be given proper platform like every child should be compulsorily be involved in art in sport or any kind of uh, you know um, any uh, talent if he she, if he or she pursues that platform should be given so according to me these are the reasons and the solutions are also there next because seeing the uh, scarcity of time i would like to answer if the uh, uh, these participants if they have any because we are working with the schools and we are working with all level children so if any kind of question uh, if i may help i'll be ready thank you sure ma'am thank you so much for such a bright insight we are running short of time so before uh, going on to q and a round i would like to introduce you all with a short video this video is about how sharp has initiated into anti tobacco programs in community and schools arithik please uh, start the video
thank you, Ritik, for playing the video. Uh, so as we were uh, playing, the video was playing, there, there were like a lot of questions pouring on. And, where, and during the addressal also, there was a lot of question we we're getting from the audience. So here is the first round of question. Uh, so Kasturi is asking from the audience that how drugs commonly cause problems and how they affect our body. So my question is uh, for Dr. Abhishek. Thank you so much, uh, Kasturi, for the question. Um, so you wanted to uh, know that how and why drugs cause problem and what kind of problems do they cause? Um, so that depends on the uh, particular drug. For example, uh, let us take example of tobacco because it is one of the most commonly used licit drug, uh, which is closely followed by alcohol. But I, I guess alcohol will overtake uh, might overtake to tobacco, it's just a matter of time. Uh, so if we consider tobacco, the first problem it might cause is, of course, addiction. Almost 20%, uh, uh, 16 to 20% uh, of people who start using tobacco would ultimately develop addiction. And by addiction means they had difficulty in controlling their drug use, difficulty in reducing the tobacco use, uh, despite the harmful consequences persistent to persistently used uh, uh, that uh, particular drug and which requires sometimes require medical attention like medication sometimes uh, if it is a uh, milder form then it might also be taken care of by counseling like uh, brief intervention or other tobacco cessation counseling um, but in the long run of course tobacco there is no organ perhaps in the body which is uh, spared by tobacco uh, starting from your mouth uh, to esophagus to all the you know uh, aerodigestive tract as they say uh, it is a leading cause it's a leading cause of all the killer disease across the globe so cancer coronary artery disease disease cerebrovascular accidents tobacco is the leading cause of uh, everything, leading contributing factor. These are all chronic disease. So uh, no particular one uh, etiology could be attributed to this to this particular uh, conditions, but tobacco is one of the leading causes. You know, if, he, if you can remove uh, tobacco, so perhaps it could reduce the uh, incidence of these diseases significantly. Uh, so after tobacco, alcohol, alcohol, the proportion of people once again who develop dependence is around 10 to 15 percent. Uh, in addition to that, alcohol is a major cause of roadside accident. In India, perhaps is the second or third most common cause attributed uh, uh, because attributed roadside accidents. Uh, violence is an important uh, outcome of alcohol use, especially during the time of intoxication. Uh, the chronic alcohol use causes liver damage, which is uh, the most common organ. Perhaps it has been seen that people who are consuming alcohol have been consuming alcohol for more than ten years. Ninety to ninety-five percent of them, uh, of their liver, uh, is affected, uh, starting from fatty liver disease to alcoholic liver disease, and sometimes to cirrhosis, which might also require liver transplantation in extreme some cases. Um, it uh, lowers the immunity significantly, at, le at least at this point in time, we are all very much concerned of COVID-19. And um, if your general immunity is low, this is true for all the drugs. Uh, I'm talking not only about alcohol, alcohol, tobacco, everything. This will, in general, lower the immunity and increases the chance of risk acquisition, mortality because of COVID-19, hospitalizations because of COVID-19. Uh, all the risks would increase if you if you use these drugs. Marijuana or cannabis, which is uh, which people talk, uh, think that it might not be as dangerous as other drugs. Uh, uh, there is a drive, ongoing drive, to le legalize the recreational use of marijuana as well. But this is once again a myth that uh, marijuana does not cause health damage. The major uh, reason for concern uh, for marijuana is the psychosis. Almost uh, 
marijuana increases the risk of psychosis to three to six times. So people who are who had not used or who had used uh, marijuana is three to six times more likely to de develop a severe psychotic condition, which is known as schizophrenia. I have already talked about the significant amount of cognitive decline, which might cause due to marijuana. Marijuana also attributed to roadside accidents, at least in the several states of USA, which had legalized recreational use of marijuana. They have also started uh, looking for marijuana uh, in the uh, among the drivers uh, uh, using the breath analyzers like alcohol. So it is uh, inhalant. Uh, somebody had actually asked a question regarding inhalant. Does it cause a uh, health damage? Yes. I think uh, uh, Dr. Basu has responded to the question already. One of the major cause of concern is the risk of suffocation or asphyxia, as, uh, as me medically said, because uh, what the method they use is known as bagging. So they uh, pour the content inside a bag and they then uh, inhale from the bag directly, plastic bags. And you know, this might cause asphyxia. There is a uh, danger of uh, you know, catching fire because these are highly inflammable, inflammable products. So these are uh, causes of direct damage, direct danger. Um, in the long run, they, they can cause significant cognitive impairment because they will go to the brain directly and cause brain, uh, significant brain damage. We have seen patients with uh, psychosis because of inhalant use. Um, so yes, there is a lot of health damage once again with recall that could be resulted from inhalant use. Um, if you have still further questions, so I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So there is a follow-up question to this. Like nowadays, uh, we are seeing that children are developing habits of taking things which are generally not seen as drugs, like shoe polish or um, like uh, dry blood or the balm, pain balm. So how can we prevent it? Like most, I, I got this question from the audience only, like so Suraj asked this question and some of them are asking that how can we prevent these things? May I answer that? Yeah, sure. To somebody specific? Yeah, no, 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 ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. So in our education program, when we speak and edu educate people, we get them to see what is it that the body needs? What is it that the body needs to survive? The body needs food, food, fresh air, water, clean water. And if, <clears throat> if anything that the body is consuming, which is not food, water, or air. It is toxic. It is a poison, right? So if you're eating anything or taking in anything which is not food, water, or air, you're basically putting in a poison and the body is going to react to it. Now, when you educate a young person on, the, on these, you will see, and we also educate them on what is causing them the high. What is the high? You know, there's a very... There's this big uh, glamorized thing of high, you know, in our songs, in our movies, in the way, and it's like made an, into an excuse for doing a lot of things as well, right? So we, we kind of, in a way, de-glamorize the high. The high is not what is caused by the medicine or the drug or that other toxin, whatever it could be, the variety of toxins, the poisons that you're eating, the high is caused by your body's reaction to get rid of it. The body builds up energy through all your reserves, through you know the muscles and the bones and everything and pulls in energy at that time. It's the function of the liver to pull it all in and then release that to be able to break that toxin down and maybe throw it out, sweat it out, one way or the other, get it out of your system. And that sudden release of energy or the upsurge of energy is what we term as high. People term as high. But they forget to see that there are many a times the high is also a bad high. It's not a good high. There's another one, there's another word for it called, you know, the the there's a high, which is you get this energy, but you get like if somebody has taken marijuana, it's not always that you're feeling peaceful or happy. There may be times when you start crying and you cannot stop crying for five, seven hours. You have a compulsion to keep crying. and You cannot control your body from that feeling. 
you know so these are all of these are toxins the way any toxin works suppose i've had a hip surgery and i need a painkiller i need a painkiller i will take a painkiller for that hip surgery but if i continue to take it or somebody who doesn't need it for the surgery or for whatever reason takes up painkillers it is an abuse of a drug similarly if you're eating butte polish or you're eating garbage from a street your body is going to react to it and we get young people to look at it and start answering questions for themselves this is if we start telling them this way this way this way they are going to rebel many many of the reasons why people go into addiction is also because they're rebelling maybe they're rebelling about something else but they don't know how to rebel against that target so they rebel another way in a very you know covert you know underhand way they rebel that way but they will rebel because if the pressure on them is so much to follow something that they don't understand anything that you don't understand and you're being forced to do you're going to make mistakes with that whether it is our education whether it is say our legal system whether it is anything that we make very complicated and we don't get them to look for it for themselves they are bound to start making mistakes with that and we believe in that and that's how we work okay. thank you so much ma'am thank you uh, it's my humble request as we have so many question can we extend the webinar by 15 minutes if everybody is okay with it all the panelist i'm okay i'm okay i think it's important to answer the questions yes sure sure thank you so much thank you so my uh, next question is for dr uh, gorang uh, so does the social environment of students particularly the behavior of their family teachers and peers have a correlation with the substance abuse among adolescents sure i think this is one of the Uh, most i think in my first slide only i showed that uh, peer use and uh, parent use of uh, uh, products uh, has a very strong significant positive correlation with uh, uh, use of products in fact in some of the settings we observed that uh, parents are sending their children to get these products for them and uh, in that process this children uh, get addicted to these products so this is found in one of our uh, focus group discussions uh, the study that was conducted in the communities so um, and the shopkeeper did not ask for age uh, of that so it's illegal to sell these products to children uh, i'm talking particularly about tobacco of course you won't uh, get those other drugs in that way but uh, yeah so uh, i think uh, use of uh, tobacco is strongly uh, related to use by parents and i think it would be in the range of two times to four times in most of the studies that have been conducted uh, in india also outside india uh, it's a very strong positive association between parent use of friends use of tobacco products uh, and it's the peer pressure ultimately uh, and that's what some of the interventions have uh, successful interventions have uh, targeted like uh, uh, giving the youth those skills required to resist the pressure from uh, peers um there's a very strong pressure always from friends and peers to you know start using these tobacco products so yes i think these are very important even in case of newer products as i said in case of newer products uh like the electronic cigarette study that i mentioned uh, peer and family use uh, was very strongly co associated with uh, use of these products and also intentions to use in the future so that that that, that uh, if the family is using then they the child might start using and he might have intentions to use and that might lead to future use so that is very important to target the family members as well uh, in the interventions as some of our studies have already done thank you so much sir so there is one follow up question to it like as you said that um, like uh the family should be uh be focused and uh, there are studies also have shown that most of the individuals start their substance use during their adolescence and treatment is done after few years so how parents can identify early if their child is in to substance use or not 
See, that's uh, those signs start appearing early. Uh, if if there are any uh, changes in child's behavior or child is trying to hide something, uh, even uh, some of these uh, products are now uh, they were available in the type of USB USB like devices that were difficult for parent to identify that they were like electronic cigarettes or something. So even those products uh, are being used by, by children. But yeah, I think uh, tobacco, uh, as I said, smoking, the parent would be able to identify if uh, the child is smoking, either due to the smell that comes or, uh, or in case of other drugs, maybe due to their behavior changes uh, and so on. So I think they would be able to uh, cite those changes in the child's behavior early on. And I think the other panel members are uh, more capable of responding to this uh, because uh, uh, in, in cases of other drugs, I'm, I, I'm uh, sure uh, what happens in case of tobacco, but in case of uh, other drugs, uh, how to deal with that, I think some other panelists will be able to deal with that. I can, I can add to that, if that's all right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sure, ma'am. Uh, see, we would look at, uh, see, tobacco definitely has its own major uh, things that's discussed and Dr. Kurang has already said. But when you look at e-cigarettes, which are, cam which are uh, more and more young, targeted towards younger people, you know, it started out as something which they claimed was for people who were wanting to quit smoking. But people who continued with e-cigarettes did not ever quit smoking because it was more potent than ever before. And what they started doing is they started looking at flavored versions, you know, gummies and um, strawberry flavors and all of that and attracting and the imagery and the advertising that went ahead was for a younger and younger lot. And like you said, it was a simple USB. Parents did not realize it was plugged to their computers and children would, uh, you know, quietly take a puff and everything. Now the... I would consider that as similar to a synthetic drug. What is a synthetic drug? It is a man-made drug copying the original. But now what they've done is they keep altering the chemical composition so that they can stay away from the illegal. You know, there's a whole schedule of drugs which all narcotic departments keep listing and saying this is illegal, this is illegal, this combination and that combination is illegal. And uh, what happens is these chemists go back and then keep changing the composition to stay out of the legal factor. And then they can advertise, they can do all of all of that. Um, at least in India, we still have a containment. The go government has taken a very strict, uh, you know, uh, stand on it for now for on advertisement, which is a good thing because more and more children feel, but word of mouth also, everybody thinks it's flavored water or what if it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, Tobacco, they're drink, taking tobacco thinking they're not inhaling those smoke fumes which cause cancer. Now, this is all false information. When we educate them, we correct this false information. It's very, very, very important to educate. The, the bottom line to everything is to give them the information, right? So a synthetic drug clearly gives sleep changes. There will be sleep changes in the child. There will be a a, a slight agitation and a kind of a, you know, flutter, you know, like an, they, there will be an agitation in the child. He will be more short and angry. He or she will be more short and angry or accusative of the parents or the environment or the teacher or the subject. He will move away. You will find he'll probably be locking his door more often. Don't come into it. Now, we usually think, of course, it's adolescent. They're allowed to have that private space and all of that is fine. But if you see that, as a parent, you need to be more alert. You need to watch. You need to observe the eyes. You need to observe their sleep pattern, their food patterns. All these drugs affect. Tobacco also affects, uh, you know, how much they eat and their fatigue level and everything else. You'll see the signs. So look for signs. It's very important to look for signs. And uh, we, we do educate parents on how, what are these signals you know, things to look for, for different uh, programs. Yes. I hope I haven't taken long. No, no. Thank you so much. Um, Ma'am, do you uh, miss? Yes, yes, doctor. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gorang and Dr. Basu for alluding uh, 
very nicely to the uh, question. Uh, one, two general points basically, which has found to have a very good evidence base uh, uh, in the uh, a component in the parent skill training, uh, which, which actually all of us or all of those who are parents who are listening can do. Number one is uh, how does the child uh, spend the free time? So that is the first thing. Second, the friendship pattern. So monitor the free time and monitor the friendship pattern. Uh, by simply monitoring these two parameters, you would be able to pick up most of the drug use or related behavior. And uh, because as rightly point, uh, pointed out, but, uh, because initially drug use might not produce any significant change in the behavior. Behavior change might come later uh, at a later stage when the uh, child had developed something like a substance use disorder, et cetera. So these two points, one monitoring free time and two friendship patterns are common to all drugs. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So uh, my next question, I will be taking live from the audience. Uh, so I have uh, Pallavi. Pallavi from the audience. Ritik, please unmute Pallavi. Hello. Hello. Hi, Pallavi. Please introduce yourself and uh, mention your, your the city you live in. Yeah. And the question you want to ask the panelist. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, first of all, thank you so much for such an informative session. Uh, and I'm Pallavi and I'm from Noida. Uh, so my question is like, how can we have a conversation with parents about their child's behavior towards substance abuse? Like how do we approach the parents uh, when talking about substance abuse? Ma'am, you, um, Anu ma'am, you want to take this? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sure. Uh, here, I would like to tell you that uh, in school, what we do, we create a triangle, a triangle where uh, the school, including teachers or management, then child and then parent. Now, this triangle is the solution to all kind of behavioral changes. When a parent is seeing or observing any change in child behavior, we request them that please come to us, please come to the teacher, the child is close to, or you can come directly to the principal, directly to the coordinators, then share that behavioral changes, uh, symptoms, so that, and then we can take the help of counselors, and then we can work on it, because counselors, they need to, they know how to connect with children, and then to solve their problem deeply. So same is with us. If a child is facing any problem with teacher, he can share it with parent, parent can come to us. So this whole triangle will work like in solving the behavioral changes, taking off intoxicants will be the later stage. Behavioral change is one of the reason and that problem can easily be sorted out if it is observed very keenly. As a ma'am already told that there should be a strict watch on these kind of changes food changes or habit or friends or any kind of change you're observing. So we need to create a safe environment where the parents are free, where the children is free to share uh, their problems and whatever they observe. I, I would like to add one more thing to Anu ma'am. It was very nicely yeah. said, this triangle. Um, one of the things that I feel very strongly and I've noticed is that we tend to put a lot of blame and onus either on the parents or the parents put it on the teachers saying they are mostly in school or we put it on peers or whatever. I feel firstly, parents are the bedrock of a child's uh, life. And firstly, when we speak and we counsel and we talk to people, we try not to break that, uh, you know, that link. It's a very delicate link at the, mm -hmm. at the time of adolescence. At the time of adolescence, we don't, we do our best not to put any blame on the parent or on the child. So whenever we bring in blame or we say, you know, they are spoiled or you didn't do this or you didn't do that. Basically, that's never the solution. Because if that was the solution, we would have fixed it by now. 
we've not fixed it by now so the thing is to build that bond even more and see how we can get the parents the confidence that they need to be able to deal with the situation and talk to the child and i think collaborative learning should be there because a child if he is observing that this is my strength so give a push to that strength, that strength. and yeah. wherever he is lacking that lackness can be covered with the other strength so this is called collaborative learning we can create that kind of environment as well so parent always always it's a humble request please uh please respect every strength of ch- uh, your child whatever strength it, it is it will help you to remove that weakness so this is my suggestion to all of you thank you so much ma'am thank you basu ma'am and thank you anu ma'am so my uh, next question will be from atiba from the participants atiba ritik please unmute atiba hello yeah i'm unmuting her i think sharan uh, just read, read out the question yeah atiba is yeah, here. Am I hi yeah hi atiba yeah hi good evening to all the panelists and uh, to everyone who are present here my name is atiba humayu and i'm from delhi my question is what are some of the ways to reach out to the adolescents who are indulged in substance abuse so you know as to make them understand about the hazardous effects of it on their health of uh, dr abhishek would you like yeah, to sure. answer the question yeah yeah sure sure uh thank you atiba and uh, uh, so if what you were basically asking that how to approach an adolescent who who is already into drugs or drugs or alcohol whatever so uh, the the uh, best evidence based intervention is known as the brief intervention which which uh, it's also known as a screening and brief intervention which can be done by a counselor by school teachers by uh, by medical professional of course by psychologist by anyone and the training it's maybe uh, with a one day training you would be able to uh, carry out the intervention by yourself uh, this consists of a screening instrument or a screening tool which is, which is uh, around 10 you are going to ask around 6 to 10 questions that depends on which tool are you using and which uh, drugs are you uh, sc- uh, screening for uh, so after the after this after that screening you will give feedback to the child so the feedback is usually screening based feedback so whatever the question uh, the child has answered positively you would you give feedback to that there is a feedback which is known as normative feedback so sometimes the now children and adolescent are, are under the impression or the myth that m- most of the children and adolescent are doing drugs so that is a myth Do, uh, those kind of uh, myths can be busted during those normative feedbacks and there is a component of personalized feedback for example you have encountered an adolescent adolescent who had recently uh, n- uh, finding it difficult to cope with the studies and had falling grades etc so you can actually talk about that falling grades and talk about the impact of the drugs on the falling grades not directly but let the child or let the adolescent talk about that you can ask the adolescent that what do you think about your drug use do you think your drug use could have an impact in your uh, in your academics uh, or had you been not using drugs uh, Would, would would that have mattered in uh, your, in your uh, academic performance uh, there are other ways of, of asking questions like how do you see yourself uh, down the line after say 5 years or 6 years and how do you think you are going to achieve it uh, and how may i help you to go in, uh, to to achieve that uh, achieve those particular goals so uh, uh, these are the uh, different strategies counseling strategies which is uh, kind of incorporated in the brief inter- in- incorporated together as brief intervention so uh, if you are interested i would share my 
email ID and I would I could also share some useful uh, training material with you uh, developed by the WHO uh, on screening and brief intervention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for sharing the counseling strategies with uh, us. And I hope Ativa must have got her answer. So, uh, so we come to the end of the webinar. Uh, I thank everyone uh, for joining uh, this webinar, the audience, the panelists, and uh, I hope we got a lot of insight today about drugs, how to. Uh, uh, and the, about the counseling strategies and about the prevalence and the risk factors. Uh, before ending the webinar, we have a poll, uh, a post poll for all the participants. Kindly fill it. And uh, here are some of the announcements. Uh, for more updates about our pro programs, projects, and webinars like this, please subscribe our website, uh, www.schoolindia.org. And uh, you can also get the information of the next webinar in this website. Thank you. And your certificates will be mailed uh, to your emails uh, soon after the webinar or tomorrow. I Thank, once again, thank all the panelists, Dr. Abhishek, Dr. Gorang, uh, Ms. Vasu, and Ms. Anu. Thank you for joining us today and taking out time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.